Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Sergei Yermolin. I do work for Intel. Uh, Ashish is a good uh, old friend. I'm not in Intel capacity here today. I'm here as just an engineer sharing with you what I learned over the last few years. There was a bit of a miscommunication with the organization of this um, meetup. Somehow, probably through my fault, uh, it was advertised as a talk about cafe, torch, and TensorFlow, and big deal. I don't know anything about cafe. <laughs> I don't know anything about torch. I know enough TensorFlow to be dangerous, and I'll be happy to share with you what I've done, a small project that I've done on TensorFlow at the end of the presentation. Uh, I know much more about Big Deal and Spark, and sorry about that. I love for you to ask questions, but the way the presentation is structured, there are like three, four slides, which kind of give you a topic, and then it creates a logical pause for questions. So if you could hold your questions until I say go, and then <laughs> throw them at me. Okay, um, a little bit of an advertisement. Intel it provides free compute for you guys if you want to do something useful with deep learning, in particular using our big deal deep learning library. What it means is it is absolutely free. We will pay for your for rental of the servers and compute time on uh, AWS, I believe, right? Um, it's not 100% straightforward. If you follow this link, it will take you to like a Google Doc where you fill out what you're going to do with it, and we trust you. Um, if you say that, hey, I want to use all the capacity you guys can give me to mine bitcoins, we'll probably not give it to you. Uh, it's kind of an honor system. We do it to promote what our library is, and also to we ask you, once you're done with what you're doing, share it with the community in a, in a forum like that for benefit of everybody. Believe it or not, it, when, I, when I speak at a conference or when I man booth at a conference, every now and then somebody comes up to me and says, gee, I didn't know Intel was doing software. I thought we were doing chips. We indeed do software. There are thousands of software engineers working at Intel, working at Intel from very low level drivers and simulation uh, software to high level uh, applications like that. So we are definitely a semi software company. Reason why we came up with the big deal library is also very interested, interesting. Um, Intel is a profit driven company. And uh, when Apache Spark came along, it became a very powerful and popular success almost overnight. The problem was that it was easy to stand up your own cluster of two machines and do something with it. If you didn't know what you were doing, once you tried to scale it up to 256 machines, it would stop working or it would go down to its knees or you would start seeing crashes. And people started blaming Intel for it. They started saying, damn, this Intel servers, you know, they just don't work very well. So uh, our group, Big Data Technologies, scrambled and stood up a sizable team. I think by now we're about 100 engineers whose sole purpose in life is to make sure that Spark runs well on Intel platform. They support all components of Spark, Hive, uh, even, I think they even support Pig, even though I think that's about to die its natural death. And um, about a year, year and a half ago, when we started going to customers, uh, we started hearing saying, you know, we have this spark, and it finally runs well. And we have these terabytes and petabytes of data. And we do some machine learning with it, some linear regression, logistic regression, and this and that. But wouldn't it be great if we could do some deep learning with it? Because we hear it's really good. And we started helping them out, and quickly we realized that there are no libraries that natively allow you to do deep learning on Spark. And our principal architect, um, Jason Dyke, had an idea that why don't we write our own? Remember, that was early 2006 when there was no TensorFlow on Spark, no Cafe on Spark, there was nothing. And so we did, and um, we modeled it after Torch 
uh, because at the time it seemed to be the best and most complete package. Things have changed, but that's what it's kind of modeled after. And we, were, we rolled it out in the, the end of 2016. First, we went after features. We made the feature parity, we reached feature parity with major frameworks. And then we went after making it robust. And now we go, we're optimizing performance. I know there will be five questions, at least from the audience, asking me how well does it perform relative to GPU? What is the benchmark for the performance? I'm not going to answer any of them. Uh, because Intel as a company takes benchmarking and performance really seriously, there are teams of hundreds of engineers doing it. And uh, we are in the process of doing benchmarking. When we're ready, we will release it. I'll be happy to come back and share it with you when it's official. Trust me, we're working on it. We are fully aware that we need to fill this gap. We just went after features first, robustness and documentation and user friendliness second, and performance optimization we're doing now. Any questions so far? <laughs> it is very fast. <laughs> OK. So what is Big Gill? Uh, yes, please. Hadoop sucks. <laughs> once there was Spark, once there was Spark, there was no reason to, do, uh, to go work on Hadoop. It was just so much faster. All the data has to be in memory for Spark. Right? Yeah. And there was enough for the data that you Well, there was Spark. They had RDDs. Now they have data frames. We just leverage what's there. So the question was, how come uh, since Intel uh, sells through distributors, the end users were able to contact Intel? It's open source. You go to this uh, GitHub, you navigate through it, there is a user group, Google user group. You go to softwareintel.com, big deal. There is tons of docu documentation. And uh, you can contact me if you have questions. The question was, what's the difference between Spark Core and CUDA Core? They're different. They both have core in the name, but I think that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? OK. So um, this is Spark. It, it, it's, it's, uh, there is Spark core here. And down below, there is your yarn, which, by the way, means yet another resource manager. I find it really funny for some reason. And uh, there is a HDFS system uh, file system below. On top, you have this. Uh, Spark components, uh, Spark SQL, Spark R, Spark Streaming, MLlib, GraphX, and big deal right here. It is not, right now, it's not part of uh, Apache Spark, we hope yet. Hope soon it will be. But you can install it, and um, it's fairly easy. Back, even in the beginning of this year, installing big deal was somewhat of a chore. Um, right now, I think we're at, we're about to release a big deal version where you just do pip install big deal. Done. It uh, sucks in uh, math, Intel math kernel libraries that guarantee you that you're going to be fully optimized to run on Xeon architecture. It brings in uh, Maven. It brings in uh, all the GitHubs that you need. It's, it's that easy. So a little bit more of the same. Um, this is a whole Spark infrastructure. As I said, there is Yarn, Zookeeper, Flume, Kafka. And we sit right here. And uh, what's good about it? It's end-to-end -end data analytics pipeline. You're, in, you're natively integrated with big data Spark ecosystem. It's scaled out. It's distributed by design. Um, the last five bullets really have nothing to do with goodness of Big Deal. It's uh, goodness of Spark. Now, somebody's going to ask me a question. Why this? Why not Cafe on Spark or TensorFlow on Spark? Um, I hope when we have benchmarks, I'll come, be able to come back and say, because we run faster. Um, I can give you a hand-waving argument that because we built it, natively on Spark, whereas taking something that was not designed to run on Spark and moving it to Spark, 
we are able to achieve better integration with less inefficiencies. And when you parallelize your tasks, you can achieve better, uh, smaller granularity of your parallelization. Another big, big benefit that we think uh, we have is uh, with Big Deal, you run your applications as Spark program within Spark context. So you basically you run your, you write your Spark application either in Python or in Scala. By the way, Big Deal is written in Scala and it has a Python API. No, we are not planning on adding R API anytime soon. Um, you write it as a, as a native Spark application and you do not need to have another wrapper. If you look at TensorFlow and Spark, the way I understand it, you have your TensorFlow code that runs on a single CPU or GPU. And then on top of it, you have to have a wrapper that takes this code and tries to parallelize it on multiple workers, on multiple machines. So now you have these two apps, right? You have your native TensorFlow, and then you have this extra thing. And you need to, if you make changes in one, you need to make changes in another, and so on and so forth. It quickly becomes, in my opinion, not scalable very well. I don't want to give an impression that uh, I'm bad mouth in TensorFlow. I think TensorFlow is wonderful. I'm really impressed how well Google rolled it out. A year ago, it was absolute pain in the neck to work with. Right now, its API is so good, particularly 1.2 version, that my personal opinion, give it a year or two, um, it'll make Keras obsolete. It'll become so easy to use that uh, you'll be able to write very high level apps uh, very easily. So TensorFlow is great. Just it was not designed to run on a distributed Spark system to start with. Any questions? So the question was why, since Big Deal is just a regular Spark library, why isn't it part of MLlib? Um, it was very difficult to start adding things to MLlib and go through incremental uh, commit processes. It was much easier to roll out a separate uh, library, do the, all the QA and verification on a separate library, and then stand it up as a separate library. Mm, I'm afraid that's all I have. Um, I agree from the user standpoint, it would probably be better if um, we just started shoving more and more and more deep learning features into MLlib. It just hasn't happened that way. IBM, by the way, I think they're going this route. I think uh, IBM, they, they have their large Spark development center in San Francisco. I think they're adding things to MLlib. But I don't think yet it's made it all the way to Apache Spark. You have to have like separate IBM uh, distro of Spark, and then you'll have it. OK, good. If there is additional value, then we start our, you know, our own project. Uh, but if it's just kind of add on to MLlib, I don't see a reason why it's a separate project, because it's the same level of abstraction as MLlib. Yes, it, you're absolutely right. It, now looking back, could, have, could it have been done this way? Probably. There were reasons why we chose not to do it, uh, because it, we wanted it to be our, a separate library which we control and we can release um, at our cadence and add to it. We would love for it to be integrated. Uh, it's fine. Again, um, you're probably wondering why is Intel standing up an army of 100 engineers to do open source project. We want to sell servers, plain and simple. Uh, sales of servers to data centers is what pays my salary, that's what pays Dave's salary, that's what pays the salary of 100 engineers. Ultimately, we don't care if it 
if somebody were to make it make a big deal part of uh, MLlib, I don't think Intel would care because I don't think it would affect uh, sales of service, uh, servers, and that's all that matters in the end. We're not selling it. We're making it available to you guys. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, I hope it stops, stops at some point. So what are the features uh, of Big Deal? Um, as I said, we are feature parity as of February of this year with the Cafe and Torch. Things are moving very fast, but as of back then, we were feature parity. Uh, you have the very low level blocks. If you want to build, completely start from scratch and build your very own deep learning network, please knock yourself out. You have all the nonlinearities, you have all the convolution layers, you have pooling layers, you have batch normalization layers, you have everything. You have uh, cross entropy, whatever you want. We also give you pre-trained models, the standard VGG, ResNet, uh, or forget Linet, Inception, and others, uh, which you can import and start working with something that's guaranteed to work. Um, we now have very good examples, uh, almost as good documentation. I keep uh, fixing it uh, almost daily. Uh, it's written in Scala. It has Python API. Any questions on the features? Uh, so the question was, do we support other machine learning algorithms, or is it only for deep learning? Uh, what, give me an example of other. Clustering, compression. No. No. Um, that's what MLLib is for. It's optimized to Intel architecture via use of uh, Intel math kernel libraries. And uh, even though it, of course, runs on top of JVM, uh, we very often do, do uh, Java native uh, interface calls bypassing JVM when performance is not good. We have GPUs to catch on to, right? <laughs> yes, any other questions? OK. Um, so um, how it works. Um, you know, if you know Spark, you know how it works. Um, but let me just spend one minute. You have a driver, which is a generic name for a master Spark program. It has nothing to do with low-level drivers. So this is your driver. You have your Spark program written here. That's where your Spark context is. You call the jar of uh, Big Deal library, and, uh, and it spawns uh, Spark jobs, which in, in turn launch uh, workers. So one worker per one core, per one thread. Uh, runs on top of JVM. You have a Spark task, Big Deal library, and Intel MK library interfacing to the metal. Uh, it is heavy synchronized heavily synchronized. Um, you feed batch. Suppose this is, uh, for the sake of argument, suppose this is uh, SGD, synchronous gradient, gradient descent, right? You take 32 images, give it to this worker. You, get, you have another 32 images, give it to another worker, and so on. You let them go. They do their batch. Things stop here under control of master. The model gets updated. So. Everybody, in every worker has a complete copy of a model. They run through it. Right here, it gets updated. All the parameters get updated. And we continue on until we die or until we achieve the required number of epochs and so on. This is what's generally called data parallel mode. There is also model parallelism. We do not support it. Um, there is a great philosoph philosophical discussion uh, would it be better if uh, we let them run asynchronously? We tried. Back in 2016, we tried. We got it to work. We found that uh, convergence was not good. And uh, at that point, we really wanted to release this library, so we backtracked and only released synchronous mode. I'm now working on a project with Berkeley's RISE lab where we want to see if we can reintroduce uh, some asynchronous features. Uh, it's a project called Drizzle. Um, we want to see if we can uh, run these guys asynchronously so we can they don't all have to wait. 
because not all of these nodes are the same. You may stand up a cluster with different machines. If you're using containers, then this the same server may be, do, may be doing web hosting while you're running Spark. So the speeds of execution of every worker may be different. It, on the face of it, it makes sense to do things asynchronously. We tried, didn't work, we we're going to try again. Any questions? OK. I have a, yeah. So you said you're doing data parallel. Yeah. So you have the data distributed across the worker nodes, different data on each worker node, or the same data on each worker node? No, no, no. It's different data, data on each worker node. As I said, uh, you take your batch of 32 images and you send it to this worker. You take a batch of this work, uh, 32 images and you send it to this worker. Then you randomly pull them. Once you updated the model, you, from your training set, you pull another batch of uh, images and you continue. Yes, please. The question was, can I substitute Oracle database, Maria database, or uh, MySQL database instead of Intel? There is no real database here. I mean, we're, we're pulling data from HDFS system as data frames or RDDs. No, we're not in business of helping NVIDIA. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Uh, so what model parallelism is, the, is this? If your model is so big that it doesn't fit on one compute node, then you're screwed. Then this doesn't work. Then what you want to do, you want to slice it in several slices and then start processing it in parallel. In fact, I think the very first work by Alice Krzyzewski in 2012, which actually reignited the interest in uh, deep learning for vision, was done on two GPUs. He, he, his model got so big he couldn't fit it in one. So he actually had to split the model, run it on two GPUs, and then merge the results later. It is very difficult. I have a hard time imagining how I would do it. If I were to have a model, how would I, I would split it so, OK, I can multiply matrices kind of half. But then in the end, when I have my final fully connected layer before I actually send it through nonlinearity, it would have to be done on one system. It is possible, I'm sure. I think it's much easier to just pay more money for more memory or bigger compute and get it going. I, none of our customers came to us with this problem. I'm sure once they do, we will solve it. It's just we have uh, many customers asking us for much <laughs> more basic things right now. Yes, please. Have you started making this run on Phi? Have we started making this run on Phi? Yes, we have. Yes, we have. Uh, we have a team work, uh, trying to port it to Knight's Landing and Knight's, Knight's Mill, yes. Yes, please. So are we using any of the hardware accelerators from Nirvana? Are we using any of hardware accelerators from Nirvana? The answer is no. Uh, we would love to, and we will. Um, not, not at this point yet. We're in very close contact with Nirvana folks uh, as soon as as soon as something get, is working, we'll, we'll be sure to make an announcement. Any other questions? Uh, yes, please. Does this utilize any FPGAs or not? Uh, no big deal at this point does not support FPGAs. Uh, we have uh, a team that is working on it, and we did a proof of concept. Um, until Intel rolls out an FPGA uh, Xeon solution, which is on a multi-chip module, which sits right next to each other and have an OPI interconnect that allows for native memory coherency, your benefits from using FPGAs are going to be heavily diluted. And those, these things are coming. They just haven't come out yet. They haven't hit the ma mainstream. If you, as, long as, as soon as you start putting your FPGA on PCI Express card and you have to communicate, uh, your benefits of uh, accelerators uh, get diluted. Uh, there was a paper presented at Spark Summit, I think. Uh, yeah, at Spark Summit. 
And we had a demo there which showed basically, yes, with FPGA on multi-chip prototype module, you can get 2x to 5x speed up for specific workloads. Other questions? OK. Now, this is really cool. Um, we totally understand that we are underdogs uh, coming behind uh, frameworks like CAFE and particularly TensorFlow. So what we invested our considerable efforts in is to make sure that we can take a model trained in either a model created in either TensorFlow, CAFE, or Torch, and we can import it in uh, BigDL, and we can train on it, we can do the inference or testing on it, we can modify the model, we allow you to modify the model if necessary, and then you can export it as well, back to where it originally came from. We're now working with a company called Lightband on actually making sure that we can import and export any model out there through some intermediary language whose abbreviation I now forgot. But what it allows you to do is very, it's two important things. One, you can do transfer learning. You can take a VGG, ResNet, whatever model you want. You can drop it in big deal. You can rip out the last layer. And uh, you can change it. And you can feed onto, into it uh, new data and retrain the model, save it. And you can take it back to TensorFlow. Um, transfer learning is very powerful. There were, uh, there was a paper presented at the conference on uh, neural networks where a team from Japan, from the Japanese uh, auto manufacturer, was able to take a few hundred images of scratches on vehicle, on cars' bodies, and uh, train their model to a point where they could, on the production line, identify defects on the car bodies they claim with accuracy more than 99%. And they, the whole paper was not about that that's what they were able to do. The whole paper was about how they tried doing it and were unsuccessful. Then they took pre-trained model. I think they used VGG, very simple model, pre-trained on ImageNet. And then once they had this pre-trained model, they just trained it a bit more on a few hundred images of scratches on doors, hoods, and roofs. And they were able to achieve this uh, Accuracy. So this method allows you to do it. If you have data on your, in your Spark cluster, or you have a lot of data in the Spark cluster, and you want to improve quality of existing model, you can, you can create your model in TensorFlow, and then you can dump it into Spark cluster, write the code that would take the checkpoint of the model, retrain it, and you can score on it inside cluster or outside of the cluster. We, go one step further. A lot of people want to train on Spark cluster, either because they want to take advantage of the massive resources, or because their data is, ma is natively in HDFS system and they don't want to export it somewhere else. But they want to score it somewhere else. They want to score it on their cell phone. We allow you to take the model and score on it as if it were just a, as, as just a simple Java file. So you can train on Spark cluster, but you can score completely outside of it. Any questions? Please. Even NVIDIA? Even what? NVIDIA, they're the small chip company. Yeah, uh, I, it's a Java program. I don't think it matters at that point. I, w I don't know why you'd want to do it, though. If you can do it on your phone, why would you want to Is do it on your phone? Let me put it this way. I don't know of anybody who tried doing that, but I also don't know of anything that we have specifically <coughs> built in that would prevent you from doing it. OK? Any other questions? OK. Uh -huh. So uh, when you load the model, okay, I guess you're loading the, the weights and the biases, as well as the network definition, which you calculate is going to be Will you, you load a model, say, in TensorFlow, you, lo you load just checkpoint file. Right, 
but those need to model as a sort of the, the definition. Yeah, you, you, get the, you have the graph, and you, you have all the weights in it, and biases and whatnot. Right. So my question is, what does it cover? So are you generating some scholar code? Uh, that, or, I mean, that's what you need to have to run the... I don't know. I'm not going to lie. I don't really know how it works under the hood. OK? Sorry. I know it does. I know it does because I, I tried it myself. I, I took a, a TensorFlow model and I trained on it and I scored on it and dumped it out and it was fine. Yes? So the big advantage of this approach is that I can import and then I can spread it over a big cluster. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can. It's very non-trivial. And don't take my word for it. Look at, uh, go to DataWorks Summit or Strata Hadoop and talk to people who do this for a living. They, they have uh, war stories of how non-trivial it is to parallelize even as good a network as a tensor, as good a solution as a TensorFlow. It is very non-trivial. No, you could run TensorFlow. You could run it on, or you could run it on multiple nodes. I actually will show if we ever get to it. I have a code example in TensorFlow where you actually specify number of workers n, but you need to have all the infrastructure to take below to take advantage of it. What is what becomes really even more difficult is if you have more. GPU, if you want to spread it among more GPUs that fit on, in a single machine. Right. So, so there is a first layer of complexity when you have like a machine with four GPUs. That's a second layer, and then there is a second layer of complexity when you have N of these machines. And you're going to make that easy? If you run it on Spark, that's what Spark is good for. It, all this that I just said that it's non-trivial, it's if you do it outside of Spark. If you do it on Spark, Spark takes care of it. There are years, years of development that went into yarn and resource management. We just take advantage of it. That's if you, things become very non-trivial if you do it without Spark, which you can. There are networks like MPIs and uh, homebrew communications network which do not use Spark to parallelize. You can do it. People do it. But make no mistake about it. They make a career out of it, and they make big bucks because it's very, very non-trivial. Yes, please. So with the, when you get buy in the picture, so then yeah. let's say we have some number of buy cards mm -hmm. in one box, mm -hmm. and then we have lock n of those. Mm -hmm. It should, be, yeah, it should be transparent. It is, it is transparent because first thing that we do, we put Spark on Phi, which is also not super trivial. But once it runs, everything else uh, is transparent for you. You have uh, Xeon Phi that has 72 cores. You can run on 32 cores. You can run on all 72 cores. If you have two of these cards, or you have, or if you have two Xeon Phi, Phi servers in the same rack on different blades, you just deploy your Spark cluster on these two nodes, and it works. Again, let me step back. Um, why would you ever want to do this? Think about it. You have this wonderful product called TensorFlow, which works. There is a huge team of people behind it. The documentation, documentation sucks, but there is a huge community. Uh, with Everybody wants to build their own GitHub. Why would you ever want to go into trouble of standing things up on Spark? There are two reasons. Either your data is too big to fit on one machine, or your compute capacity is too small. So that's when you want to go on the on distributor. And third reason, which is actually, to my surprise, was very prevalent. If you have data already, tons and tons of historical data in your 
HDFS system. If you say if you're if you're a Visa, Visa company, or Mastercard, you have all your accounts, all your customer data, all the historical fraud detection. It's all there in Spark infrastructure. You want to do some deep learning on it? Yeah, you can yank it out, all these petabytes of data, transfer it onto a dedicated GPU machine, do something with, uh, with it, then transfer it back out. You don't want to do it for many reasons. It's expensive, it's slow, you're exposing potentially security uh, issues. So why you want to do it? Data too big, compute too small, or you have so much data that you just don't want to move it into something that other than Spark Hadoop. Any questions? OK. Um, where are we? Uh, we have lots of examples, uh, text classification, image classification. Um, let's see. Uh, let's skip this. OK. Um, you don't need to know Scala. Scala is wonderful, but Python will do the job just fine. Uh, I, I'll have a much bigger example uh, later on, but this is Lenet 5, train, uh, hand, uh, written character recognitions. This is, that's all it is. That's your code in big deal. You, train, you define your train data, test data, you define your batch size, learning rate, lear, learning decay. You can have more um, fancy optimizers, but that's good enough for Lenet. You define your optimizer. You're using SG, SGD, maximum of 100. Uh, you do validation batch size. You run optimizer, checkpoint uh, every epoch, and you and you let it go. It is now in in our high-level Python API. It is this simple. You ha you take a, you can use your NumPy. You can use pine, pandas. Uh, you can plot it in matplotlib, and we even, um, yeah, people install big deal. We even support TensorBoard. So um, we, we're fully integrated with um, Jupyter. We're working on uh, Zeppelin integration. It's not as prevalent, but it is definitely out there. And within Jupyter, I mean, it's Jupyter, and you can plot things in matplotlib just fine. We also support TensorBoard. It's a wonderful tool uh, developed by Google. Um, the way TensorBoard works, it's a visualization tool that just parses giant log files. So all we have to do is dump our training data in the log file format, absorbable by TensorBoard. And you can visualize your loss and other um, hyperparameters during training with it. Any questions on uh, Py API support? <coughs> on Python API support? I'm sorry. Yes, please. So I noticed that you had a very small batch size of 32. In which case, <coughs> I don't really need any Spark executors at all because I can just run it in the city chain here. You know, uh, it could very well be that this, I just uh, did a screenshot of this running on this laptop in. Um, Oracle virtual box. So, no. So, it's, if you do batch gradient descent, then mm -hmm. maybe if you put it into mini batch, then none of that is needed. Uh, well, if you, if you have a batch size of 32, but uh, you, you throw at it uh, 10,000 data, it's still going to be processed as a um, batch size of 32 per single CPU. I mean, um, make no mistake about it. If you take, if you even if you took GPU, right, and you took a fairly wimpy data set like like CIFAR 10, no, not, not even CIFAR 10. Uh, this image size of 224 by 224, fairly small size images. Your, your K80 GPU will choke if you feed it more than 32 images at a time. It will run out of memory. There is just not enough memory in a single GPU to process all the images and store all the model parameters. And you will run out of physical memory on the CPU as well. That's why 
No, you don't want to feed it a batch size of 100 to process at a time. You will run out of memory. Yes, please. Are we putting any TensorFlow code into our CPU? Not, with the, not in the context of a big deal, but there is a sizable team of uh, Intel software engineers who, whose job it is to take TensorFlow and make sure it runs as fast as possible on Intel CPUs. I mean, as an in, uh, Google likes us very much. As an Intel employee, I have almost unlimited access to Google Cloud Compute Resources. I can just stand up my cluster and play with it to my heart's content. We, we have a very close collaboration with Google because we want uh, to make sure that TensorFlow runs well on CPUs so people buy more and so does Google. Are we putting any ASIC accelerator inside CPU. Not at this point. Eventually, maybe at some point, potentially we will incorporate Nirvana on cores onto our servers. Possibly. Yes, please. Is it this one? Oh, yeah. Uh, what? Is it rich content? Text in user. Is that for machine learning or is it from uh, Well, what? <laughs> uh, rich content. Rich content. So, so basically, you can include in a Jupyter notebook, as in any Jupyter notebook. You can include code, you can do hypermarking, you can embed images, uh, latex where you can actually create uh, mathematical formulas and so on and so forth. We support all of it. That's what it means. It, um, I'm almost at the end. I'll jump to actual Jupyter notebook uh, in a few minutes, and you'll see what I mean. OK, um, obligatory marketing uh, blob. We installed it on every major cloud service providers. Uh, we're running on Azure. We're running on AWS. We're on, running on Databricks. I'm right now deploying it on Google Dataproc. Painful, guys. Google is a wonderful company, but Azure is, Azure is so much simpler. I was up and running on Azure in less than an hour. It takes me days to plow through all the Google security features and everything. <laughs> it's a wonderful product, uh, but, uh, and it's great when it works. But uh, be prepared. Be prepared. And uh, te Google tech support is wonderful. Uh, they have this very, how should I put it, very interesting arrogance. They expect you to know, your, to know shit before you call them. And if you don't, you f they make you feel, you make you understand that you don't know your shit. <laughs> <laughs> but the product is good. Once you get it working, the product is good. The da Google Data Proc servers, they're fine. Uh, once you know your way around it and it becomes your second nature, it, it, it's great. Azure is just single button. Deploy to Azure, go take a cup of coffee, come back five minutes, minutes later, you have it. Done. AWS. Yes, please. Huh? AWS? AWS? Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah. No, I, mean, comparing. I didn't do AWS deployment myself, so I don't have first hand experience. I did uh, uh, Azure and uh, Cloudera and. Um, I'm doing Google right now. Uh, by doing, I don't, I don't mean just do. I, it means testing, validating, writing documentation, and all that stuff. Uh, Cloudera, who um, is our partner, they also did the same thing. They installed all major network uh, frameworks, TensorFlow, Keras, Cafe, Torch, big deal. They made sure they all work on their CDH. They told us ours was the easiest one to install. And, as I said, uh, obligatory um, marketing stuff. So uh, we do a lot of uh, proof of concepts. Uh, the, the way we work, our team works, is we love proof of concepts. When a customer has an issue, when a customer has a problem, we come and, and help them 
understand the problem. Um, as long as it's on Spark, and as long as they need some big deal, uh, some deep learning features, we come help them. We make it run on deep learning. We learn a lot, and customer is happy. This is our mode of operation. And we document, and we publish blogs. So now, by now, we probably have almost about a dozen, if not more, customer authored blogs where they say, this is a problem. This is how you solve it with big deal. This is a code, GitHub, everything. So we do, and a lot of it is very basic stuff. You know, single shot detection. How do you do it on big deal? This is how you do it, but it's usually not just done in academic setting. Oh, let's, this is a cat and this is a dog. It's more like, customers, we ask customers to send his, uh, driver's license to authenticate himself, and he sent us a picture of his cat. We know about it. We automatically know that that's not a human, and it's not California driver's license. It's a picture of a cat. Um, so this is a standard academic type of thing, but as I said, we do it on, on, on very different data sets. Um, we support uh, RNNs. We support LSTMs. We support uh, recurring networks and all the fun things that are happening in the area of uh, natural language processing right now. It's by far the most interesting and the most difficult part of uh, neural networks right now, as far as we're concerned. Uh, we, are, we are also starting to play around with uh, adversarial networks and things like that, but it's difficult to find a customer who has a well-defined case for generative adversarial networks. If any of you have an interesting use cases like that, that you think you have a lot of data and you, you would like to do something with it, uh, let us know. We'd be happy to work with you. Uh, we do general standard visual recognition, language processing. We do even things now where you would not think that deep learning may help, like recommendation systems, uh, fraud detection, risk analysis something, uh, applications where your standard uh, MLlib type of uh, methods give you decent performance, but academic papers suggest that with deep learning you can get uh, 20, 25, 30% uh, uplift in your accuracy or you can have a steeper ROC curve. If you do it with deep learning, if you're interested, let us know. Yes? Is there any genomics or drug discovery? I'm so, I'm so sorry. Genomics or drug discovery? Ah, I'd love to. I, we approached Genentech, we approached a small company that Genentech bought. I'm coming to, I'm slowly coming to a realization that these guys have ability to generate so much data so fast that even Spark Hadoop is too small for them. Thank you. I mean, uh, genomics field is crazy. Uh, here's an example. For $1,000, in an hour, you can generate so much data just pulling in human genome or anybody's genome content that'll take you weeks to process. With, in genomics field right now, you can collect data much faster than you can possibly process it. That's why we want to use you. <laughs> Please. <laughs> if you have an application, I'd, lo I'd love to try it. But uh, yeah. It, it's an, it's an untrivial thing. Uh, yeah, this, if it ever works, uh, I think there will be a lot of uh, student papers, but they would not, probably not be published because this would allow you to write a crappy essay, push it through NLP, and get an A. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I don't think it's at, the, at that point yet, but I think it's getting there very, very, very rapidly where you can uh, feed the body of works of uh, Shakespeare or, I don't know, Thomas Friedman or whoever your favorite author is, and then type your crappy essay and uh, push a button, go to bed, and in the morning get a perfect one. Uh, yes, we support LSTM. Um, my favorite field, uh, FinTech, transaction fraud detection. Um, this is actually one of the applications that uh, was written prior to actually current incarnation of Big Deal. 
and uh, we're now rewriting it uh, in the big deal uh, framework. Um, fraud detection, I think it's done uh, for one of the big banks. Notice here that we have uh, multiple neural networks feeding results into a bagging system. So you have not a one network, but multiple neural nets, and then you have uh, uh, voting on the results, and then uh, uh, you have uh, what's called active learning, where if 80% of your networks agree, you say yes, it's correct transaction, or no, it's a fraudulent transaction. If it's below 80% threshold, you flag it, say, okay, I need a human to look at it, and then tell me which one it was so I know for the future. This is a very interesting symbiosis of uh, supervised and unsupervised learning. And that's why I love uh, everything that has to do with FinTech because they have a very non-trivial use cases like that. Um, well, this, is, this is one of the straightforward ones. You have a steel rolling plant. They have all kinds of uh, stuff going on, acid drips. People drop sandwiches uh, on, the, on the rolls of steel. The, something gets scratched. You have cameras taking pictures of your product as it goes through the line. And by the time it reaches the final stage, you know whether or not it has, it has defects and whether it's a smudge, scratch, or an acid dri drip, and you can uh, throw it away. Again, you have multiple cameras collecting images. You have. Uh, you infer images, you periodically retrain. This by now is plain vanilla. I mean, if somebody were to come to me and say, hey, we want this, I said, we know how to do it. No problem. OK, so I think we're at the end. This is GitHub. Um, it's their uh, papers, uh, examples, code. And also, if you want more of the tutorials, go to softwareintel.com slash big deal. Um, yeah. I think we're done. Any questions? Yes, please. No, I still have the, the, I think it was a problem with Ura last year earlier. What kind of a performance you can gain from that team? Uh, the question was, so how fast does it really run? <laughs> so the answer is this. Um, if you took, and again, this answer is when we did our very preliminary benchmarking earlier in this year. Okay, so it may no longer hold true, but what was true early in the year? If you took um, fully optimized uh, big deal with MKL on latest uh, Skylake server, Skylake Xeon server, and you compared it, its performance on a single node but with, uh, but with Spark in local mode to an uh, unoptimized uh, GPU run, I think at the time it was K80, you would get uh, on par performance. Okay? So, fully optimized, big deal on fastest, uh, most recent Skylake, on par with K80 out of the box as of six months ago. We're rapidly, we're frantically working on better benchmarks than this, but that's all I have right now. Now, that's the first answer. Second answer from my personal experience. Um, so I did a project on TensorFlow. And um, I tried running it on CPU. Oh. I'm sorry, I switched to a different one. It's, um, I tried running it on CPU, and I also tried running it on GPU. I can't find the slide. Um, so in the end, what happens was you do not need GPU when you write your code. It's a waste of time. The, if you go on Google Cloud and try to stand up your cluster, uh, I think two core Broadwell or Haswell, uh, not, not the latest one, it's going to cost you about $25 a month. K80, again, not the latest, not the P100, K80 GPU is going to cost you about $530 a month. 
You do not need your GPU when you write your code and you run it and it fails. You run it and it fails. You run it and it fails and it fails within seconds. It's a waste of time to do. Yes. No, no. Uh, Nvidia K80. You do not need it. Even when your code starts to run, but you're just trying to make sure that it kind of runs and doesn't crash, that you have the, your batch size selected correctly, or your learning rate actually goes down instead of exploding, even then GPU is not necessary. You will get all these results on a single CPU. When you need GPU is when you actually have somewhat working model and you actually start feeding it big chunks of, relatively big chunks of Im data, of images. And you want to run it for five epoch to see does my, does my learning rate go down and then flatten out or does it keep going down? That's when you may see 5x, I saw about 5x difference between CPU and GPU, okay? Now, once you start running, you getting into run times of hours, again, GPU does not make sense to, at least did not make sense to me either because if I run it before I, at the end of my day and I go home and I'm not gonna look at my laptop until next morning, I don't need it to finish in two hours. It can finish in 12 hours, I don't care. So I found that GPU was very useful in this intermediate mode where I needed to do iterations very fast, but every iteration required almost a full run of the network on a relatively small size of data. Earlier than that, didn't make sense to pay the money. Later than that, it takes hours, so what? I can do it on, uh, on a cluster of CPUs or on a couple of CPUs. Yes, please. I'm sorry, what was the maximum? Memory or DUF, each core or instance. Uh, I, think you, I think you can specify it uh, when you You're asking about specification of Intel Xeons? Oh, we're not limited. Uh, big, big deal imposes no limitations of that, of that sort. Whatever Spark supports, we support. I'm just trying to see. Uh, yeah, so when, I'm sorry, what can I just put it here? So this is actually in real time, right? So you provision your cluster, uh, so that's one CPU, that's 25 bucks a month, you specify your memory, you specify number of, uh, number of cores and, and so on. And if, you, if I go here, if I can only navigate, uh, number of GPUs, so if I go, right here and I say instead of none, I say one. That's your price. <laughs> and that's before Pascal or Volta? Yeah, yeah, it's K80. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's a reasonable assumption, but I don't know. By the way, previous one, the 24 something, I think it was for Skylake. So Google somehow has a quirky pricing system that whether it's Skylake, Haswell, or Broadwell, it's the same. Probably because memory costs much more. <laughs> Any other questions before? So I have two more things that I can share with you. I can share with you the Python code of BigDL, uh, much more than that simple uh, one-pager example. That's actually done for text classification. I can share with you a project that I did myself on TensorFlow uh, 1.2, and I can walk you through what I've done and um, results that I got, and uh, I can point the cool features of TensorFlow 1.2, which I think makes it a very good network, and why I think I wouldn't learn Keras at this point. Would you compare that to I would love to. I haven't done it yet, so whatever I say would be speculation. And since I'm part of Big Deal, I wouldn't trust me. <laughs> we'll start with TensorFlow and then we'll go from there. I'm saying don't bother learning Keras because TensorFlow, as I watched it from going from pre 1.0 to 1.1 to 1.2, 
I see it becoming so much simpler that eventually I see where it becomes childlike simple. Like earlier, in the earlier versions, every layer that I instantiated, I needed to know if I had like, uh, do, if I were doing vision, visual recognition work. I had, for every layer, I had to actually pull out a piece of paper and calculate the size of my tensor. It's this many channels, this size, this size, this deep. Okay, layer one. Next layer, okay, so I have this many filters, so this is, I had to specify every dimension of a tensor. And if I made a mistake, it would run, it would crash, it would give me five pages of errors. I had to parse through them, find out where exactly it crashed, trace it back to my code, and start twiddling. No longer necessary. So it's, and that's, how, that's what was really good about Keras because it hid all this stuff from the initially. But right now there are, uh, I may be able to show you here. Right now, you don't need to do it. You can. You can write, you can still write like numpy like code in TensorFlow where you specify everything down to the minute details. You don't have to do it anymore. So, um, so this project was uh, inspired but, uh, by, one, by a real life situation where a real estate company in the Bay Area needed, uh, it, it was thought at the time that they needed to um, compare diff images belonging to different listings to see if the listings are the same. Um, they, they thought, we thought about using it to distinguish, uh, to find duplicate listing. You want to look at two images and make sure they're, and see if they're the same or they're different. If you think that it's uh, trivial, it's not. Nearest neighbors don't work because a real, one real estate agent can take a photograph, flip it, and your binary comparison just falls apart. You can't, right? Whereas uh, neural networks can easily uh, pull out the salient features. So the, this is TensorFlow. Um, again, we took uh, VGG16. Um, uh, we used it, uh, unzipped it, uh, used it as a checkpoint model. Uh, basically, we took two Two of these models ripped out uh, last layer, added one, tot uh, one uh, fully connected layer, and then put it through sigmoid. Um, I think everybody is interested in TensorFlow. If you want to see the architecture, I have PDF to show it. So, okay, I'm going to skip this first cells because this is where we just uh, specify some variables, import data. Uh, verify the data and so on and so forth. So this is this is the main function. So um, we we pull the training file names, we pull training labels, uh, we pull uh, we create validation image set uh, by randomly pulling stuff, and we create some reserved uh, test image data set. It's all Python. Uh, you can see that there is nothing TensorFlow like here. It's just your straight Python uh, right out of the of NumPy. So here where it's becoming interesting. Uh, we only have one class, 0, 1, same or different. Um, in TensorFlow, as you know, it's, it gets, it takes a bit getting used to because in TensorFlow, first you specify your computational graph, then you, then you run that graph feeding it data. Looks simple except that when you actually want to look at, the at something, at the variable in that graph, you can't just, when you specify graph, you can't just say, I want to look at variable x. You can't look at it until you actually run it. And um, to save computational power, it doesn't, uh, TensorFlow doesn't expose every variable for you. It only exposes variables that you specify. So debugging TensorFlow via uh, uh, printfs is, is somewhat non-trivial. Um, so preprocessing, this is your standard preprocessing that you usually do for video. You take a random crop, or you can uh, you can do flipping, and then you do uh, you take VGG min, you take uh, mean values from pre-trained VGG images. And so you what you want to do, you want to make sure that your data set color-wise and intensity-wise is centered, because if if not, then you're going to have problems with your non-linearities. Non um, 
so this is, this is where TensorFlow 2.1.2 uh, is really cool. Um, behind the scenes, it generates queues for you. It takes your data set, and uh, using these simple functions, you first you create constant, then you create your uh, contrib layers. For, uh, <coughs> you, merge, you merge these two tensor slices into one tensor, and uh, then, you, then you call on it the parse function that was called above. It does nothing more than just uh, manipulating images uh, and color adjustment and so on. And then you call this, uh, that batch with the batch size argument, and it creates a queue behind the scenes for you, which when call starts feeding you from your data set, set images of uh, batch size 32. You have to go through this initial setup, but then in the end, your main, pro, your main code becomes very simple. We do the same thing with the validation data set. And then we call this uh, iterator. So this is a construct uh, that pulls it from structure, uh, train, batch train data set and batch uh, output data set. And your images and your labels are outputs of the, of the iterator get next. So you have this behind the scene queues, which iterator function pulls for you. Then you, of course, going through your init, training it, validation it, testing it. And uh, is training, of course, because we want to check how things really work, whether or not things work well or not. And uh, so here, where, this is uh, how TensorFlow deals with calling the, pre, uh, the saved model. So we pull VGG with arc scope, with weight decay, num classes, which is one. Yes, we want to train. Uh, we have a dropout, we specify dropout probability. So this is the uh, output layer number seven. And uh, this is uh, the layer, and this is the layer that we, we create. This diff layer is, uh, we have two networks with two images and we do just a diff between them. So we let the images go through the entire network until they reach the final layer. And at that point, uh, they're no longer images, they're just feature vectors. And we do a diff between them and we put that through nonlinearity. Um, so th this is just a location of the pre-trained model. And uh, let's see. So I'm going through initiation, but look how elegant TensorFlow allows me to pick which, uh, which layers of the model I want to keep, which values of which layers I want to keep, and which values I want to throw away. So this is VGG without layer eight, VGG without layer seven, and this is my fully connected layer extra. It, it may be somewhat scary. I define losses, so we'll skip it since we're out of time. But this is actually, we're done with the graph building right here, okay? This is where the execution starts. I initiate function and I run, session run, I, need to, I initialize my last layer, uh, my layer eight, layer seven, and my last fully connected layer. That's it. Everything else, I don't initialize. Now, what am I doing? What I'm doing here, I'm only upgrade, updating weights initially of the new layers that I created. They're in, initialized randomly. I'm, pres I'm preserving the VGG layers one through six, and I'm only training the last layers for a few epochs. And then again here, I, uh, and then, uh, I check the accuracy. And then further down here, I'm training the entire model uh, on the train in it here. And remember I told you that to actually look at anything, you actually need to make an, out it an output of your session, and then you, you want to look at legits, labels, 
prediction and loss. You have to specify them. You can look at them only here. You cannot look at them further up there. If you try printing something further up there, you'll get the shape of a tensor, but you will not get the value. And, uh, and that's it. The rest is uh, just uh, prints and uh, printfs and um, calling the functions to uh, test for accuracy, precision, and so on. It's, an, it's straight TensorFlow, TensorFlow project, no big deal. <laughs> the question was, how would big deal improve on this? Um, it would allow you to parallelize it better. Because here, I'm limited to batch size of 16 or 32. That's the limitation of my uh, NVIDIA memory. If I had big deal with 16 nodes, I could run uh, 16 times 32 images in parallel and then uh, update the model. So I, I would probably run faster if uh, this uh, 1 to 5 ratio holds, 1 GPU, 5 CPUs. So if I had 16, I would run three times as fast. Yes, please. Yes, of course. Of course. Yes. You, yes. Yes, yes, there is, a, there is a company in Sunnyvale called Mellanox Technologies that made a great business by making uh, internet communications fast. Do you guys have any questions? I'd happy to stay behind and ask you. Okay.